All right. Welcome back, everyone who's joining in person and uh, virtually. Um, I'm Joe McCaffrey from Philosophy. It is my great pleasure to introduce our second and uh, sadly uh, last speaker of today's event, uh, Professor Corey Maley from the University of Kansas. Uh, Corey is actually someone who spent some time in the great state of Nebraska, is familiar with Omaha, and also completed a bachelor's in philosophy and a bachelor's of science in psychology, mathematics, and statistics, and computer science, and computer science <laughs> at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. So someone who's done a breadth of interdisciplinary work already starting off, some of it here in Nebraska. Uh, Professor Bailey did his PhD at Princeton University in their logic and philosophy of science uh, track and is currently associate professor of philosophy at the University of Kansas. Uh, professor Maley is someone who has done work in a number of different areas. Oh, and also mentioned that briefly spent a stint as a neuroimager and doing science and actually uh, has you know, taken a brain image of, of Professor Robin's uh, brain, as you can see on their <laughs> web presence. Uh, so that's a fun story to follow up on I think you can ask them about. Um, and, uh, but uh, Professor Maley is someone who's done a lot of work in very different areas of the philosophy of the mind-brain sciences. So someone who's done a lot of work in the philosophy of emotions, including recently some significant work on the moral psychology of guilt as a moral emotion. Um, someone who's written on the nature of computation and what computation is, and also various uh, questions related to what role does computation play in explanation in the sciences of the mind-brain, what are representations like in different sorts of computational systems, including brain-like uh, systems, and someone who is currently uh, engaged in a book project called The Analog Brain and is thinking deeply and penetratingly about the nature of analog computation and how the brain and therefore the mind may be an analog computational device rather than a digital one. Um, so someone who's just done a huge uh, uh, number uh, work on a number of topics, including things like is consciousness, what's the function of consciousness and is consciousness an evolutionary spandrel? Um, so someone who's done a lot of uh, very interesting work in the philosophy of mind and brain. And I'm very delighted to have him here talking to us uh, about this excerpt from his book project. So welcome Professor Mads. Thank you. Great introduction, Joe. <laughs> okay, so yeah, as you can see, um, I'm going to erase this because I might actually use the board of it. Um, the title of this talk is Analog Computation and Representation. And parts of it are going to be a little bit technical. Um, I might kind of go through those parts quickly. Um, but what I want to do is give you kind of an overview of some of my research on this topic. Um, because um, the, the program, it's, it's here, it's Minds, Brains, and Machines. Is that right? And the machines that people usually talk about in that trio are computational machines. And my view of why people want to include machines in that trio um, is partially because we want to explain minds and brains, uh, the things we don't understand all that well, in terms of something that we understand better, which would be machines, right? Computational machines. Um, so part of my research is what do we understand about computational machines? Um, do we understand them? And uh, are there other options for what they could be in some kind of principled way uh, that might make them better suited to help us understand um, minds and brains? So let me start with a little bit of background. Um, I want to understand computation beyond the story that we're often told having to do with Turing machines and computability theory. And like I said, in, in such a way that can make clear uh, whether computation is really the kind of thing that can help really help us understand the mind brain. Um, so maybe some of you uh, know a little bit about Turing machines and Alan Turing. Um, it's kind of weird upon reflection that we think that computation has a lot to do with understanding the mind brain when we think about what Turing was up to. So, you know, bear with me if you know this story already, but what Turing wanted to do was answer some mathematical questions about what things were computable. What it means for something to be computable back in the 1930s was that it was a kind of mathematical problem where if you just followed some simple rules, um, you could, you know, start with some kind of like 
starting point input, we call it now, follow some rules and in some amount of time, get an answer, right? So the simplest example that we're all familiar with is just adding a couple two digit numbers, right? This is a, a computable problem. We've all learned to take two numbers, you know, that have digits and add them in a straightforward algorithmic way, right? Um, but Turing wanted to know, you know, kind of prove things mathematically about those kinds of problems. Are all mathematical problems like that? Only some of them, what types, et cetera. Um, the thing is, if you want to prove something mathematically, you have to do it with mathematical things. And just saying, you know, can a human compute this? That's not something that's amenable to a mathematical analysis. So what he did was come up with a mathematical model of what humans do when they do these kinds of problems. And that's the Turing machine, right? So he said, okay, the Turing machine is, is my mathematical model of what humans do when they compute these problems, right? And so now that I've translated what humans can do into this mathematical model, now I can actually do some math and show certain problems are computable because I can show that there's a Turing machine that does it, right? And the hypothesis that these Turing machines are a good proxy for what humans can do, that's called the Church Turing thesis. Um, most people believe it's true. There's no evidence that it's not true. But, you know, the whole, the whole idea was let's turn this intuitive idea of, you know, well, yeah, we know that addition is computable to something we can actually prove and then move on to other mathematical problems, right? Now, interestingly, Turing machines and what Turing was doing, that was, first of all, not a theory of what computes. It's a mathematical theory, right? If you've already decided that something is the kind of thing that can compute, then Turing machines and other theoretical theoretical computation can tell you some things about it. But it doesn't tell you what those things are in the first place. In the same way that um, number theory can tell you about prime numbers of things, but number theory doesn't tell you what things can be counted in the first place. Like if you're wondering about, you know, you're looking at some clouds and you wonder, does that really count as two clouds or three clouds or four clouds? You can't go to the mathematician and say, well, you have a theory of countable things. so. Tell me your theory, you know, does that help me? Once we've already decided how to count clouds, then number theory kicks in, right? Same thing for computability theory, computation and theoretical computer science. It doesn't tell us what things compute. Just as once you've already decided that they, they do, whatever your criteria are, then the theory kicks in and we can tell you some interesting things perhaps. And also it's based on this limited formalization of human computation. Like I said, it's based on this idea that, you know, Here's a computation. Oh, oh Ben died. Well, that's not a computation. <laughs> right, one. Follow the algorithm. You all know it. Hopefully, I did that right. There's this thing like your IQ drops like 10 points when you're writing on the board. Um, <laughs> that looks good, though. Um, so, you know, that's a kind of computation. And Turing said, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to formalize that kind of computation. Individual discrete symbols, the following simple rules, right? Um, but as a theory of computation that then became the basis for what machines can do, it's kind of interesting that we took a very limited thing that humans do, used that as theoretical computer science, made a whole class of machines based on implementing those things, and now we're at this point where we're saying those machines, based on this theory of computation, are going to help us understand what minds and brains do. And it's almost circular, right? Because what explains what minds and brains do? Oh, computation. Where does computation come from? Oh, well, computation is a mathematical model of what humans do, right? It's not totally circular, but it's a little close. So. This is a nice picture of someone who is or was a human computer. And this is, you know, back before there were computing machines, the electronic kind of things that we all call computers now. Computers were mostly women who, there was a job position, right? A lot of people know this now. And they were employed by different, you know, scientists and engineering firms and laboratories to perform computations, right? A computer was just a job description. 
what computers did was not just a bunch of this. I like this picture because she's using a slide rule, right? She also has an adding machine. But they didn't just do things this simple, right? For Turing's purposes, it worked for the kinds of questions he was asking, which were mathematical questions, to model just this kind of thing that human computers did. But human computers did much else that can't be modeled on this kind of simple computation, right? So one other kind of computation uh, that's been completely forgotten is analog computation. And insofar as it hasn't been forgotten, it's been mischaracterized. So part of what my research is, is looking into what is analog computation really about um, and figuring out if it's relevant to these kinds of, you know, understanding the mind and brain in computational terms. I mean, it's interesting in its own right, almost more of a kind of like, you know, historical project. Um, very little has been written about analog computation, like the history of analog computation. I mean, in the history of technology, very little has been written about computers. What has been written has been written by computer scientists and mathematicians, and they're usually not very good at writing history. Um, but the actual historians who've written about computers, very few of them have written anything about analog computation. So it just, it's kind of an interesting thing to dig into in its own right. Um, but also, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit here. I think it's arguably a better kind of computation um, insofar as computation is at all relevant to uh, cognitive science and neuroscience. The idea being, if it makes sense to say that the mind-brain computes in some literal sense, it does so in an analog way rather than a non-analog way. But that also requires getting really clear about what analog even means, and that's not trivial. So we'll get to there too. So just, I mean, probably most of you in this room don't need to be convinced about this, but just to make clear that, you know, this isn't like a totally cartoon view. Um, this is the neuroscientist Christoph Cook. He starts this 1999 book, The Biophysics of Computation, which is a seminal computational neuroscience book with the sentence, the brain computes, right? And in 2005, there's this review article uh, from Reviews in Neuroscience by London and Hauser, and um, they're German and, well, Christoph Koch is German too, but they're much more sober and they begin their review article with brains compute, no exclamation point, right? So this is something that neuroscientists actually think. And if you just look through journal articles, you can find lots of instances where people say that, you know, brain systems, neural systems, individual neurons, whatever, are engaging in computations, right? So this was just a quick little survey I did. Here's one, the neural computation of inconsistent choice behavior, high degree neurons feed cortical computations, looking for the roots of cortical sensory computation in three layered cortices and tracking the flow of hippocampal computation from separation, pattern completion, and attractor dynamics. So these are all recent journals, but this goes back to you know, the mid 20th century. Um, the first clear example is from Warren McCulloch and Walter <laughs> Pitts, where they had a kind of early, uh, something like a neural network model that they thought was a kind of computational the mo model of the mind. And then uh, Jonathan Neumann in the 1950s, one of the last things that he worked on before he died was this really interesting book called The Computer and the Brain, showing how some of the computational principles uh, relate to what we understood about brains at the time. So the idea is out there. And like I said, you probably all don't need to be convinced of this, but you know, there's some evidence. So let me give you a little bit more of an outline of what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the talk. Um, there's a very close thing that people talk about when they talk about computation and philosophy um, that I want to make clear that that's not what I'm talking about, um, just because it, it invites confusion. And then because most of us are not familiar with analog computers, I'm going to illustrate some 
actual analog computers. And that's where part of, I mean, parts of it are like, I think really clear and cool. Parts of it are like a little, like there's some calculus, um, but you'll get some ideas, I think. And then, then the question is, okay, so what makes analog computers analog? And I have something to say about that. Um, and to kind of contrast it with an everyday conception of analog, because just to give you, well, we'll get there. I won't get ahead of myself. And then finally, um, I'll talk about some examples that are relevant to cognitive science and neuroscience to try to show you why this you know, actually matters um, for the mind-brain part of the mind-brain machine triad. Okay, so here's what I'm not talking about, which is computational simulation. There's a big literature in philosophy about using computers to do science. And it's ubiquitous now. So pick your favorite science, like astronomy, or chemistry, or geology. And there is someone doing computational versions of that. Like there's computational astronomy, and computational astrophysics, etc. And that's usually about um, using computers to simulate some kind of scientific phenomenon of interest, right? And so just because videos are fun to look at, um, here's four of them. And these are actual examples from various fields. This is the formation of an F1 strength tornado or an F1 class tornado. Um, this one is a couple of um, galaxies that are spinning around each other and starting to merge. This is a picture of DNA that's being heated up. So it's starting to like, you know, denature the part the two helices are starting to come apart. And this is just a visual visualization of a neuron, right? So we use computers in science. There's a lot of philosophically interesting stuff there, like, you know, what are we warranted in, in you know, inferring about the kinds of phenomena that we're investigating with computers, given that sometimes these simulations are really, really complicated and they're surprising, right? That's part of why we use them because these, these phenomena are so complex, we can't do anything but simulate them sometimes. A lot of interesting questions, also not what I'm talking about. And one really succinct way to get at this, this difference between what I am talking about and what I'm not talking about is the difference between computational simulation versus computational explanation. And uh, my friend, Walter Piccinini, has this really nice article uh, explaining that. And the idea is that, you know, when we have a computational simulation of some phenomenon, P, right, like a storm or, you know, galaxies or whatever, we don't then go on to say, well, that phenomenon is something that actually performs computations, right? We're just simulating them and we're not making any claims about those things actually being computational systems or performing computations, right? But that's not what goes on in neuroscience and cognitive science. We want to explain some things and give a computational explanation of those phenomenon because we want to say those things literally perform computations, right? So the reason that machines, computational machines gets in that trio of minds, brains, and you know, machines or computers or programs or whatever is not just because, well, everyone uses computers these days. It's because we think that minds and brains in some sense or another somehow are performing computations. And it's interesting that they're performing computations and the kinds of computations and how they're doing it explains something about them, right? So I'm talking about this part, not just the mere simulation, right? So maybe no one in this audience was confused about that point, but I like to just make clear what I'm not talking about. And also just to show you some videos, so you'll you know, keep being interested. Okay, so let's talk about some analog computers because um, very few people have seen these things. Except for that very first title slide, that was an analog computer. I should have mentioned it. Um, there's a guy, and I can go back to that slide earlier or later. Um, there's a guy in London who photographs these analog computers and he's given me permission to use that image for my, my book that's coming up. 
Um, it's an East German company that obviously no longer exists, but they made these like really pretty analog computers. And they're extra pretty when you have a professional photographer and you can like wheel them into the studio and put them in this cool like turquoise background. But anyway, okay. So what's analog computation about? This is a nice um, quotation from this person who did this, this um, guest piece in the IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. So because digital computers and computation have been so successful, not a controversial point, they've influenced how we think about computers as machines and computation as a process. So much so, it's difficult today to reconstruct what analog computing was all about. And that is very true. <laughs> So what do people think analog computation is about if they think about it at all? So this is again, uh, my friend and colleague, Gualtiero Piccinini. He has a book that came out not too long ago called Physical Computation. And this is more or less what people think analog computation is about. They say analog computation is often contrasted with digital computation, although it's a vaguer and more slippery concept. Roughly, analog computers are systems whose function is to ma manipulate continuous variables. Variables that can vary continuously over time and take any real values within certain intervals, specified by differential equations, so it's as to instantiate appropriate functional relationships between the variables. The important point is most people think of analog as being continuous. It's smooth in some way rather than discrete. Right. There's another common use of analog, which is not relevant here. Uh, in everyday language, people also take analog to mean just not on a computer, right? Like I have my analog notebook, like instead of my digital notebook. Um, there is a slight bit of truth in that, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, yeah. So the other sense of analog is this, you know, continuity versus discreteness. So that's the idea, right? Analog computation essentially uses continuous as opposed to discrete or digital variables to represent or model or approximate continuous problems of interest. That's the received view. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is some examples of analog computers and also that that's wrong. If you actually go back and look at analog computers historically, there are really important exceptions to this idea that they're all about continuity. So there were three main types of analog computers. They started in the, um, really like the, well, arguably they started in the 19th century, but what we recognize as analog computers now started in the 1920s and 30s, they're all mechanical. And then there are also electronic ones and then electromechanical ones. So I'll show you some quick examples of each one. Um, the first is a mechanical multiplier. And this is a real pain to explain in words. This is a case where having a video of this is invaluable because I don't know how to write a good description of this. Like if you've seen how it works, then I can give you a verbal description and you'd be like, oh yeah. If you've not seen how it works, it's really difficult. Okay, so what this does is multiply some numbers and here's how it does it. Video play, yeah, okay. There are three different parts and we're gonna look at them in turn. A and B are the inputs, and then this is the output. So this is a video from the 1950s. So here's the input A, and here's a pin that's locked in place. A can go up and down, and it makes this little linkage thing here just swivel, right? B, is connected to A with a pin, but it can slide back and forth in that groove and that linkage. So when A goes up and down, that pin goes up and down. And then when B goes left to right, that pin slides in that linkage, right? So far, so good. That little pin there drives the output. So the output's over here. And you can see as A and B move in different ways, that causes the output to move in different ways. Now, when we have that stationary pin and the sliding pin in the same place, that's when everything is set to zero. This is all about to make sense why this is a multiplier. If we put some numbers on A and B, 
So here we have zero and then positive four, negative four, positive four, negative four, and the output up to positive 15, negative 15. When we move A and B around, we get the multiplication. So two times three is six, right? And I'll go through a couple more examples. So four times four, now it's up to 16. And we can move B down to zero, four times zero is zero. And then it works for, you know, three times zero is zero. And it works for negative numbers too. So we have negative three times four, negative 12. And that's how it works, okay? So that's a mechanical multiplier from an old analog computer. <clears throat> like I said, it's a complicated mechanism until you see how it works. And it's like really simple and I think really cool. Um, a much simpler mechanism to solve a much more difficult mathematical problem is a mechanical integrator. So if you don't know much calculus, sorry, but Integration is, you know, you have some function that can look however it looks. And integration is you want to find the area under that curve, right? So to solve that with the mechanical computer, they had this thing, which is, I shouldn't say it's like a record player, it's really not. But it has a turntable here. And then this arm goes back and forth, which follows the curve of the function. And then there's a ball bearing here and a ball bearing here connected to this turntable. And then that makes this roller rotate. So when you start the computation, this turntable goes at a constant speed. But what's gonna happen is if these ball bearings are at the middle, they're not gonna rotate at all. But as they get further to the edge of this disc, they're gonna rotate faster. This up here is just gonna keep rotating and it's gonna rotate you know, faster or slower, depending on where this is in contact. And so the integral of the function is just how many times is this thing rolling? Okay. So to see it in action. Oh, and by the way, these videos came from a series of naval training videos from the 1950s. So they're going to have labels up here um, that don't really, it's like range rate and stuff like that. These were um, made to help um, ships fire on other ships, which is actually a very complicated problem because they're moving and you're moving and there's wind speed and you know all that. And so these computers would just be hooked up to like the rudder and your propeller and then someone's like you know aiming something at a ship to try to estimate the speed and then these would automatically get the guns in the right place. So that's why they're kind of weird variable names. Um, but you'll get the idea. So this is time. Range rate is like the input. And then rate changes the output. That's the, the thing we're integrating. And so as you can see, you know, as this goes out here faster, this is rolling more, adding more to the running total. And then as this moves closer and closer to the center, it's going slower and slower until it's, when it's right at the middle, it's not doing anything, right? And then interestingly too, with integrals, if it goes you know, below the line, then you wanna subtract that area. And this does the same thing because if it goes this way on the center line, then it makes the roller go the other way. So it's subtracting things from the integral, which is exactly what you want it to do, right? So if you put a bunch of those things together, you get this machine, which is, um, the differential analyzer, which was developed by Vannevar Bush. Um, he's a fascinating figure in the history of science. He created the NSF, did a lot of really cool engineering things and then a lot of cool things for the advancement of science. Um, but all of the, all these little rollers and things, those are just a whole bunch of those things put together to solve very complicated uh, problems. Then 
when electronics got developed so that they were more stable and whatnot. Um, we have electronic differential analyzers. So those are the kind of things that they could solve the same kinds of problems, but they just did it electronically. And so as a really quick example, this is a kind of problem that you'd get in like a differential equations class where you have a mass and it's connected to a wall by a spring. The spring has a spring constant. And the problem is to say, oh, there's like friction on the floor. And you say, okay, what happens if you like push this box and then let go? Well, it's gonna like oscillate a little bit, right? And how much it oscillates is gonna depend on how springy the spring is and like what the friction is like, right? And how much you pushed it, et cetera. So that kind of problem, if you know the right, you know, you know what these actual values for like B and K and the mass and all that stuff are, um, it's really easy to just translate that into a differential equation and you can solve this pretty easily. I, these are just numbers that I pulled from a textbook, right? But then from this equation, what you can do is then just construct a circuit that's really, it's just kind of like taking the equation and making it concrete. So this is like a summer, it sums negative 80, which is <laughs> negative 80, 16 times this thing, which is there. And then also, three negative three times this thing, which is there. And like, you have to do things with negatives to get the circuitry right. But I mean, it's a pretty straightforward, like you take these equations and then you can just make this circuit out of these parts. And then that's how you make an electronic analog computer. And so then if you actually run this thing, you find out, oh, wow, you know, you push the box and you let it go and it like oscillates a little bit and then it's stable exactly like you think it should do, right? So if you put a bunch of those things together, you get the kind of thing that was on my first slide. And also this nice picture, um, this engineer, you can kind of see she's testing this thing with exactly the kind of problem I just showed you. You can see like the, the triangles and stuff there. Um, and you just plug different things in and then run it to solve whatever your problem is. So in this, this particular instance, it's outputting like just a sine wave. So it must be some kind of a different kind of oscillation problem, right? Okay, so, so far, <clears throat> those are all consistent with this idea, this received view, that what's interesting about these and what's different about analog computers is these are all continuous things, right? So I'm gonna show you some examples uh, where they're not continuous. So, this is a fantastic, this, this is the EDA, the Electronic Differential Analyzer. Very, very common, very useful analog computer in like the 50s, 60s, and through the 70s actually, before digital computers came on the scene. But here's a nice uh, excerpt from an analog computer textbook where he says, 99 and 44, 100 percent of the time, when an engineer speaks of an analog computer, he's referring to an electronic differential analyzer, EDA. But the EDA is just one type of analog computer, one specific application of the general principle of computation by analogy. So let's see, first of all, what is meant by analogy and how we use analogs in computation in the general sense, not just in the EDA. So there are all kinds of things when you look at analog computers where there were discontinuities. So if you want to have, I mean, this is just for completeness, like here's the circuit that will give you an absolute value function, right? So there's like a sharp thing there. And there are lots of examples of these when you actually dig into the literature, like this is a bang bang function, they called it, it has this little, it's not quite a full step function. Um, and then this is a soft limiter, which isn't even less of a step function. Um, this is a zero limiting function, so it's zero everywhere except when things get positive. So there are lots of examples like that. And the thing is, those were useful because, you know, if you have a problem that starts off like this, like you're doing stuff in a class, in a textbook, and you've got this mathematical characterization of this thing that you want to understand, well then cool, you can use that to like make your analog computer, right? But what if there's some problem where you don't know what the mathematical characterization is. You just have something and you want to study it and you don't know how to characterize it mathematically. 
Um, so one of the examples of things, you know, say you just had this like this curve and you're like, I kind of want to know how to integrate that or, you know, what that's about. And I have no idea mathematically where that comes from. Well, what you can do, I'll skip this quotation, is use this thing called an arbitrary function generator. And this was a very common thing used in analog computation where you say, okay, uh, we don't know how to characterize this exactly. So what we'll do is make a piecewise linear approximation with our little component. And we can add like a bunch of little linear pieces to make this discontinuous approximation to the thing. And then we can use that, you know, for whatever it is that we're studying. Maybe that's going to be connected to other things, you know, but this was actually really common. You know, usually you don't know mathematically how to characterize the thing that you're studying, right? But then also you might want like an actual super discontinuous. There are ways in which those previous things I showed you, mathematically speaking, they're technically still continuous. Things like this are technically absolutely not continuous. These are real discontinuities. Things like step functions where it has a value for a while and then it just jumps to another value and there's just nothing in between. And so the way that, um, one way that they made these kinds of things is with, this is a kind of cool component. It's an electromechanical step function generator. So it's electrical because we're using electrical signals, but it's mechanical because there's an actual mechanical thing that moves to connect the circuit parts to generate the voltages that are the output. So what's going to happen here is we have a circuit that goes you know, from here to this kind of clock dial, and it's going to spin down here. And as it makes contact with this, this is like a big resistor, this is going to generate some value. But then when it touches this one, the resistance is going to be greater. So it's going to output a different value. Then when it touches this one, well, this actually goes down to here. So then it's going to have a different value. And so it's going to output like discontinuous levels of voltage, right? So that's what it looks like as it goes, it outputs different voltages. And you know, you can, if you increase the speed of this rotation or you move these things around, these things were, you know, adjustable. So you can make any kind of weird step function you wanted, right? But the thing is, this is still not digital. This is all happening before there were digital computers, right? So this idea that digital is just discrete, it's not that. And the idea that analog must be continuous, this proves that too. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that pretty soon. And one thing, if, if you're a math nerd, you know that if you have a step function, any kind of step function, you can approximate it with a continuous function if you want to. So, you know, using a series of sine functions and cosine functions is one easy way to do this. You can, you can you know, kind of approximate the step function with just a bunch of continuous functions. Why not just do that? Well, the short answer is whatever method you use to, you know, approximate a, a step function like this with a continuous function, you're going to introduce errors. So in this particular kind, there's this thing, uh, I think it's called Gibbs phenomenon, but I'm not sure about that, um, where right at the edges, see, it's like, it's pretty good right here, and then it gets worse and worse, and like, right at the edges, it gets really bad. Those errors build up if this is one part of you know a big system. And so the idea is, well, why not? If we are trying to study something that's discontinuous, let's just use discontinuous things in the first place, right? So this quotation says that, I'll skip that. Um, so going back to this received view, analog computation essentially uses continuous variables, et cetera. Um, that just isn't right when you look at actual examples of real analog computers. So then the question is, what is analog computation about? And this has been part of my research. Well, it's analog computation. It's, it's computation that involves analog representation. Solved, right? Well, no, I owe you a story about what analog representation is. So here's a mouthful um, that will make sense in a minute. But the idea is it's representation where the quantity that you're representing or that's being represented varies 
kind of mirrors the physical property that's doing the representing, okay? And that actually makes a lot more sense than that verbal description uh, looks like it does. And this was a view actually, um, David Lewis was the first to really put this forward way back in the 70s, and he was pretty much ignored um, until I said, no, David Lewis was right, and let me tell you more about why. Um, so props to David Lewis for that. You might have heard of him. He's, he's done some other work in philosophy. It's not David Lewis. So I'm going to show you some other examples of analog representation that are more familiar and tell you, you know, what it is that makes them analog on, on my account. And for a lot of these, you'll just be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense, hopefully. <laughs> so um, mercury thermometers or just liquid thermometers, analog thermometers, they're not mercury anymore. Um, vinyl records analog clocks. These are all, you know, we all agree these are analog representations. I agree they're analog representations. And I have a story for what makes them analog. So let's look at just the thermometer for uh, simplicity. So the way that an analog thermometer represents temperature is via the level of the liquid, right? It's usually alcohol these days. Um, so here's a representation of 25 degrees. Here's a representation of 90 degrees, right? One way of thinking about this is as the thing that you're representing increases, so does the thing that's actually doing the representing. It literally increases in some way or another, right? So the height of that liquid literally increases as what you're representing literally increases, right? Same for decreases. A digital representation, so here's a representation of 25 degrees, here's one of 90 degrees. Um, this two numeral string is not greater or less than or anything else than this two numeral string. They're just different, right? What they represent has a relationship, right? 25 is less than 90, but you know these are in the same font. They're just a different sequence of symbols, right? So with the digital representation, you don't have that mirroring between what's doing the representing and what's being represented. Whereas an analog representation, you do. So if you contrast analog representation with digital representation, what's going on with digital representation is you have some representation, uh, some physical things that are representing digits, right? And then you take the digits together and we have a convention for doing this and that represents some kind of a number, right? But in analog representation, you have some physical stuff that has a magnitude and that magnitude just represents the magnitude of the number that you're representing, right? So it's actually a very different kind of representation. It's not just one's discrete and one's continuous. There are very different kinds of representation. Digital representation is about representing digits. And then we have this convention that says, you know, there's the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, and there's a convention for combining them. And then that represents a number. Whereas analog representation is, no, there's just some magnitude that's doing the representing, and it represents the magnitude of what's being represented. So one way to kind of get at this, this is kind of a mouthful, I realize, um, but a way to kind of see this is to think about an analog to digital converter, the kind of thing that's in a lot of electronic devices, um, where what we want to do is convert an analog representation of seven to a digital representation of seven. So in most digital computers, as you know, um, we use binary, that's not critical for this example really, um, but it just, it's what we use. Um, and in an analog representation here, so are we taking an analog representation and converting it to a digital representation? If we just look at the voltages, we have seven volts coming in, an analog computer, seven volts represents seven, right? In um, digital computers, 
Usually we represent zero by zero volts. And we represent one, number one by five volts. That's just the convention. Sometimes it's different, but that's usually how it goes, right? So just looking physically at what's happening, seven volts goes in here, and then we have the sequence, zero volts, five volts, five volts, five volts. And then we can say, okay, so what do all those voltages represent, right? Next step. Well, for the analog case, the seven volts just represents seven, right? But the voltages, the zero volts, five volts, five volts, five volts, that repre those represent the numerals zero, one, one, and one, right? There's no further step to say, okay, well, what, what is this? voltage or what does this seven represent? Well, that's that's it, it represents seven. Whereas in the digital case, we have to say, okay, well, what does this represent? Oh, well, it's the binary numeral zero, one, 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 which in fact is the binary representation of the number seven, right, according to that convention. So there's kind of an extra representational step in interpreting what the, the digital representation is. Whereas with the analog one, it's just the magnitude of the voltage, right? That just is what's being represented, right? <clears throat> so the distinct aspect of analog representation is that it represents magnitudes of numbers by magnitudes, by physical magnitudes, right? Voltages, heights of mercury, um, you know, the physical grooves in vinyl records, the angle of the hand on the watch, right, on the clock. And digital representations represent the digits of numbers, right? The individual digits and then the strings of those digits we interpret according to some convention, okay? So although this often corresponds to a difference between the one being continuous and the other being discrete, this is really not the fundamental difference because you can represent magnitudes in discrete ways. Like that clock is ticking in discrete ticks. If we just pay attention to the second hand, it's not digital because it's doing it in discrete chunks, right? It's still analog because we're representing the number of seconds, the time by the angle, right? Or an hourglass. You can have an hourglass that's full of fluid, Right? And it's representing the passage of time by the amount of stuff that's in the bottom part of the hourglass. And whether you're doing that with liquid or with you know really, really fine sand that looks like liquid for all you know, or obviously particulate sand that's like clearly discrete, it's still analog, right? So this one's continuous, one's discrete, that doesn't get to it at all. There's a much more interesting and more fundamental difference here. Okay, now we're going to switch gears to talking about brains. So, way back in McCulloch and Pitts, um, they thought that, well, all neuroscientists thought that neurons are characterized by, you know, all or nothing spikes. And they thought that there was a clear analogy between these all or nothing spikes and propositional logic, right? True and false, right? So then they went on to build a kind of computational theory of mind from that in this paper. And this idea that neurons generate all or nothing spikes or action potentials, I mean, that's a very, very entrenched idea. So, you know, a lot of times when people are using, say, information theory to characterize what brains are doing, you know, they'll look at a train of neural activity and see, like, it is like background noise. It's unavoidable, but, you know, there's like a spike every once in a while. And then they'll just kind of encode this as a series of ones and zeros, right? Say, okay, there's a spike, that's a one, no spikes or zeros. And we can just treat these as kind of binary events. But this isn't really the whole story of how neurons work. And we've known this for a long time. So one thing, um, I'm showing you some examples where this idea of an analog representation has been around in some sense or another for a while. We just haven't really called it as such. So way back in the work of Adrian, the 1920s, he was one of the first who noticed um, 
if you take the muscle of a frog and you put some weight on it and you look at the neural spikes that happen, if you just look at the frequency of the spikes, the more weight you put on the muscle, the more frequent the spikes are, right? Well, this looks a lot like an analog representation, a discrete one, right? But what's happening is we're representing this weight, and as that weight increases, the number of the spike frequency increases, right? So that's a kind of simple example of a discrete yet analog representation, right? That we've known for a while. Much, much more recent research has shown that it's really not always the case that a neural spike is always the same kind of thing. You can still find textbooks where people say this, that you know the individual neural spike doesn't carry any, any information. What matters is how many there are in a given time, their frequency or something like that. But very recent research uh, is putting pressure on idea, that idea that shows that you know actually, and this is largely because we haven't had the precision and experimental techniques to actually see that there are these differences. Um, or if we've seen that there are differences, we haven't been able to see that they make a difference to the next neuron. But, you know, sometimes neural spikes are a little shorter than others, or they're a little wider. And we found out that those do actually, uh, in some cases, have downstream differences. They actually do matter to the next neuron, right? So this is a kind of example where it looks like this could be a place where an analog representation can get in too. Right? So um, people unfortunately call this analog digital modulation, but this is there are a few labs that are very much involved in this now. Um, and you can't see it, but this made me really happy. They cite me. Really, two thousand real neuroscientists cited my stuff. So, I mean, that might not ever happen again. But here's just another another picture of it. Um, this is a quick little drawing showing there's variations in like you know what happened. You know, so there's the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron fires, and there's variance in the spike at the axon. And you can say, oh, postsynaptically, you know different shapes of axonal spikes actually have differences in the pre or the, the synaptic currents, right? So it's kind of cool, puts pressure on this idea, like I said, that uh, brains are all or nothing and that there's this, you know, nice binary kind of representation we can just steal from uh, digital computation. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of the stuff since it looks like I've been going on for like an hour now. Um, and just say, wrap up here. Um, this is repeating. Analog computation, I think, is com computation that involves analog representation. And hopefully, I've given you a brief idea of what analog representation is. And there's more to say about, OK, so what makes a computation, right? I told you what representation, analog representation is. What makes a computation? Um, and this is the stuff that I'm kind of working on now. Um, this is again kind of a mouthful, but the idea is take a something like a thermometer again, right? Um, it has a lot of physical properties, but there's only one that matters for it being a representation. It's the height of the liquid, right? There's all kinds of other physical properties it has. When you're using, when you're doing a computation, what you're doing is somehow there's a mechanism that manipulates just the properties that are doing the representation. And I can talk about that a little bit more, but the idea then is this can be formed into a more general story about computation that'll work for digital and analog and perhaps other kinds that are neither, where you say, what is computation? Well, it's the mechanistic manipulation of representations. What kind of, rep of manipulation? We got to represent, you got to manipulate the properties that are doing the representing. Well, okay. What makes it digital versus analog? Well, if it's a digital representation or if it's an analog representation, 
Um, so that's the kind of next thing that I'm doing is developing this. And then when that's all done, um, you know, hopefully we can say, yeah, actually, you know, it does look like neurons are involved in these analog computations. There are some really straightforward cases where it looks like that's true. Um, like the muscle stretch response. There are a lot of cases where it looks like there's an analog representation where the neuron is just firing faster as a stimulus intensity increases or some dimension of the stimulus changes, right? Um, there might be cases where it's not. I mean, the nice thing about having a really concrete, specific account of computation is it makes it so that um, it's a falsifiable hypothesis whether the mind brain computes. I mean, if brains don't do this, then there's not really a good reason to call it computation, right? Um, I would like to think that whatever computation is, it's got to be the kind of thing that people were doing when they built computers of the analog type and the digital type. And, you know, maybe minds and brains don't do that. Um, Maybe there's some way of saying, no, they do compute, in, but in some kind of ad hoc way, but then that's gonna be a really, you know, I'd like to know what the story is that makes that worthy of being called computation. So that's, that's part of my motivation for doing this is to say, okay, let's not just say that this is like a kind of, you know, saying that minds and brains compute is just kind of a, a stance we're gonna take. Like, no, let's make it something that, you know, we can really like sink our teeth into and say, are they really doing this or not? So, um, and one kind of takeaway I hope that, that I've made clear here, and this is something I've been writing about more recently, um, analog computation or analog representation and, and thus analog computation, it really takes advantage of the physicality of representations rather than abstracting away from it. And this is that little kernel of what makes it the case that, you know, it's kind of true when people say the physical notebook is analog rather than, you know, it, when they just mean it's not on a computer. Analog is about physicality. Um, digital representation is about abstracting away from physicality. I mean, that's a powerful idea in digital computation. It's what makes it the case that, you know, it wasn't clear that my PowerPoint thing, my keynote thing here was going to run on my computer because the dongle wasn't working. So we we're gonna transfer it over to Sarah's computer and it would have worked, right? They're absolutely not the same machines in a sense, but also they are in terms of like they're being digital computers, right? We can totally abstract away from the specifics of the machine, the physicality of the machines, right? They're not even the same model of laptops, right? But we know that it would still work because that's then that's what makes digital computation the thing that it is. But analog representation is really tied to the physical structure of the representations. You can't abstract away from it. Um, and just one more example that's kind of a fun way of, of driving home that point. Um, if you compare a vinyl record and a, a CD, if, you know, CDs are still around sort of, but, um, you can take a vinyl record and you know stick a pencil in the middle hole so that you could like turn it on the table here. And then you can take a needle, like just a regular sewing needle, and a cone of paper and you know make a little taped cone and put the needle on the thin part. And you can turn the record and put the needle there. And you can hear the recording, right? It's gonna be really quiet and tinny. But if you get the speed right, you can actually hear the physical recording, right? Why? Well, because the shapes of the vinyl, the grooves in the vinyl, they just mirror the actual waveforms that are projected in the air, right? If you do that with a CD, first of all, the, the divots in the CD are much smaller, but the divots in the CD are just ones and zeros. And the ones and zeros then in turn represent numbers, which represent the music. But if we were to do that with a CD, it would just be noise because it would just be ones and zeros, right? So this is a way to kind of illustrate the way that the analog representation really relies on the physicality in the way that the digital abstracts from it. So that's a good place to end. Um,
like I said, I'm, I'm trying to kind of work this into a general account of computation, um, which I mentioned before. And yeah, that's it. I'll end there. Thanks very much for your attention. Are you happy to take questions as well? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll take a question from students uh, first off. I'm actually going to line hop with a question and then we'll go to the folks. I'm going to exercise my MC, you know, stuff. So, uh, so, do we have any uh, students for the first question for Professor May? I've convinced everyone, Joe. This always happens. <laughs> line hop, Joe. Go ahead. What's up? Go ahead and line hop. Uh, okay, so my line hopping question was just that I was thinking um, of the cognitive difference between analog representation of magnitude with symbolic representation of number. Mm -hmm. So cognitive scientists usually think that there's a, you know, a way, a, a mechanism shared by humans and other, other mammals that, you know, represents magnitude the size of a blotch a small blotch versus a large one or a short tone versus a long tone mm -hmm. and they're the I, I think the underlying you know what this kind of accumulator mechanisms that have been proposed to explain how these various animals are able to do that really seem to fit your yeah you know they would be an analog computation i think pretty clearly on your kind of definition but cognitive scientists like to talk about there being you know, a an analog way of representing numbers is either just like I see that they're you know short, larger, or smaller, but I can also represent numbers with a symbol. You know, that's then linked in some kind of arbitrary way to this fixed quantity, and that that's a fundamentally different kind of thinking about numbers or a different way of cognizing about numbers. And so I'm just curious whether, in the grand arc of your account, you're wanting to say something like, you know, I'm capturing. I totally, you know, that that symbolic number representation is a digital thing analog representation of number is an analog thing i'm trying to capture the analog parts of the mind or if you want to say even the apparently symbolic and contrasting with analog parts of our mind are actually like an analog machine running a digital simulation yeah, or a symbolic like simulation so i'm just curious what you had to say about that. i mean that sounds like an empirical question to me which way that's really going to go i mean my my idea is this you know make really clear what the analog uh, stuff can be because even cognitive scientists have made this mistake of thinking the analog has to be continuous, right? Um, and so they'll like Randy Gallisil has done this many times where he said, you know, well, clearly it's uh, it's it's not digital because you know it has to be continuous. Or, you know, he makes these like really fundamental errors where he doesn't allow for um, uh, discrete analog representations. Right, where you have an accumulator, but the accumulator just, you know, it increases in like single steps or something like that. Right. And so then he wants to call that digital. And that just seemed like an, a really obvious mistake to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm happy for there to be non analog processes in the brain. I'm not saying that, you know, the brain is only analog and where it seems like it's not analog, it really is, but, you know, it's being implemented as an analog. You know, thing, and then at some higher level, it's it's not analog. I'm just trying to make clear, you know, what the what the the right account of analog should be in some really principled way that makes it so that both, you know, it does justice to what people were talking about, you know, to a large extent when people were really doing analog computation decades ago. Um, but then also makes it so that, um, you know, there's analog computation and digital computation. And they're they're different in clear principled ways, but also similar enough so that there is you know there's species of the same type of computation, right? It's not just like well you could have called them something totally different because they don't really have anything in common at all, you know. So does that? Yeah, absolutely. Answer? Okay, that was a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, and then I don't know. I saw I saw this and. Then... Oh, is this my turn? Yeah, we can go ahead and then sorry. Oh, sorry. Maybe you have the next question after head Yeah, sorry. I was like, <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could say something about computation and representation, because it seems like um, 
computation is like it's doing a bit more than just representing, right? Because you're, um, so I don't know, I guess it's like maybe, uh, and I just wasn't, because it seems like a lot of what you were talking about was about analog representation, right? Yeah. Representations of, of systems or like dynamic systems or something, right? And it's, and again, it's unclear whether or not those systems are actually computing or if they're just like doing stuff. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so I was wondering, because like, I think there was a slide where you said like, you know, you don't want, you don't want to make a claim about like the, sim like you're not simulating something that computes. Is that the slide? I can't remember now. It's like not a simu simulation of something. It's not. Yeah, we're not just simulating that. I mean, like people do, and that's yeah. fine. But yeah, that's not. I'm not interested in just computational simulation. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. So like, are we? So yeah. So I don't know if the if those analog representations are actually computing, right? So like the vinyl record is not computing. No, that's not computing. Right. That, I so, mean, if it is, it's a really, really simple computation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like, because I was like, um, so like. So for example, right, so, you know, like before we had like digital simulations of things, people would build these like large scale models, mm -hmm. especially like, um, like, you know, one of the things that the Army Corps of Engineers were in interested in was like, um, is the Mississippi River going to like flood this yeah. year, right? So they would make this like ginormous model of the entire Mississippi River <laughs> that's like, you know, over that's like over like 200 acres, right? Yeah. It's like an entire model. And they could like fiddle with it and say like, okay, well, it's gonna like flood here, it's gonna flood here, so that means we need to like raise these levees over here, and like you know, um. So that's so I don't know, like it. So that seems like representation, right? That's a model yeah. of the it's an analog model, yeah. right? It's an analog model. So would you say it's also doing con computation because like you can fiddle with it? So in some ways you could actually, and it's very precise, right? So it can actually tell you like, if we add in water here, yeah. like over here, the river is gonna rise by like, you know, like by how much, like two feet or whatever. And it's like, it's really precise. So it actually happens, right? You're off by like a couple inches or something. So would you say that's computing? I don't know. I don't know what computing is now. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, because on the one hand, it sure doesn't look like a computer, right? I mean, yeah. it's, if you said, oh, I have a computational simulation of what's going on in the Mississippi River, and then you pull out your, you know, scale model. Yeah, well, your 200 acre scale model. Yeah, 200 acre scale model. <laughs> You're like, that's, that's weird. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, there were real analog computers, things that people called computers, like there's the one called the Moniac. Uh, yes. Yeah, which was like this, you know, a liquid analog computer of, I think it was like, was it the New Zealand economy? No, something? the British economy. Was it the British what? economy? Yeah. A Commonwealth economy. Yes, right? it's, the, um, it's the British economy because I there was one at the University of Leeds in the business school. I that they, it was on it's on display. I went to look at it. It's weird. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it essentially yeah. did the same kind of thing, right? Where yeah. um, the the representations were slightly more abstract yeah. rather than you know visually looking like mm -hmm. uh you know elements of the mississippi river yeah um you know what what does you know the gdp look like i mean that's not a physical thing so it was like represented by like i don't know a cylinder or whatever right yeah and then you could represent um you know flow in by yeah. like adjusting the flow of the water yeah yeah it's like um, money coming in out of the bank it's like yeah yeah, yeah. so i mean that the the scale model that does what it does uh, because it has, you know, the same physical features as the Mississippi River, except it's just smaller. I mean, that sounds like a kind of analog computer to me. It's kind of a weird one, um, but yeah, why not? It could, because it has, it's representing things, right? Um, via, you know, the physical, the actual physical characteristics, right? And those things are being manipulated. Like you said, you can, you know, play with the values and see like different things are going to happen, right? And, you know, we might be willing to call it a computer if it, you know, were a little more abstract, like the way the Moniac is. But I mean, that's, that doesn't seem like an essential feature to me. Um, but it doesn't seem, sorry, can I have a follow -up? It doesn't seem to me that the Moniac is actually a computer either. Oh, it, okay. it's, a, it's a model of the economy. Sure. So... And we build 
models. I mean, we could have like lots of different types of models of the economy, right? So this is like a weird like hydraulic system mm -hmm. of the model of the economy, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like uh, like it's it's all it's I don't think it's computing. It seems weird to say that it's computing because then because it's not because not I don't think not all models like you know even dynamic models that like have moving parts or whatever right mm -hmm. that you can fiddle with and stuff are are computational systems yeah right I mean, that's a, yeah that's a good question um i mean so for my account what's going to make it a computer is if it yeah if it has representations and then you can manipulate those representations in some mechanistic way so some models you're not going to be you're not going to be doing that Right, you're just going to be filling with them, you know, in some non-mechanistic way. So I think that would be, you know, what makes something the computer versus not. But I mean, it sounds weaselly, but like in my defense, it's a hard problem to say, you know, what's the line between when something is a computer at all, right, for anyone, um, because you know, is something like uh, is a desktop calculator is that a computer? Or, you know, if you had a machine that all it does is add numbers between, you know, one through 10, does that count as a computer? And it's really hard to draw the line between, you know, what makes something, it's too simple for it to count as a computer versus not. It's really hard to draw that line. But I think in, in my case, for my account, yeah, things like the Moniac would count because they're representing and you're literally manipulating the things. As I understand the way that thing works, yeah. you know mechanistically yeah you're and you're manipulating the properties that are doing the representing yeah yeah but i mean you know okay yeah, yeah. i'm just kind right. of like but thank you yeah yeah okay i just have a it's really kind of a uh a weird question so when you were talking about the um at the very beginning, the error that occurs at the beginning and the ends of the um, going from a continuous variable to oh, the, con the continuous approximation of the step function. Yeah, yeah. I was curious if, and then you talked about like action potentials being all in that, and how you you said you, I think you mentioned that there could be like if if that if you force those. Um, into an all or none, you end up with disruption down to the next neuron. Is there a possibility of that? That wasn't quite a, what I was saying. I was saying, so for a long time, the kind of dogma was that um, you know, neurons fire and those spikes all look identical. And then it became clear, you know, once we could measure them with a little bit more resolution, like there is some variance, but that doesn't matter. Like that has no effect at all on like the next neuron down. And now we know that that's not true. There is a little bit of variance in the neural spike and that variance does have effects on the postsynaptic neuron, right? And that variance in the neural spike seems like it could be a representation of, you know, an actual thing to the organism, but that part's unclear. Um, but that's what I was saying, yeah. So I guess my question is then, mm -hmm. because it, because of that error slash variance that happens, sorry, I'm a psychology undergrad. Yeah, no problem. Um, that error variance that happens that you see and you know happens, and you know that uh, continuous to discrete, mm -hmm. is that kind of evidence then for, I guess, evidence against the, the all or nothing? Yes. And then and yeah. is that where that is that where you got that? Is that where, where that comes from? I guess are the two uh, is the existence of that that variance kind of um, I guess do they equate are they equivalent? Well, that? okay, so let me can I can I talk for a couple minutes, Joe? You, Corey, you could talk for as long as you Awesome. We're okay. your captive audience. <laughs> that, that all went by really quick. And that's that was my goal. Um, so part of why I brought that up um, that I didn't mention, um, you know, there's, there's 
how that could be part of a kind of analog system, but it's also evidence against it being like a digital system. Oh, that's right. That was what I was trying to ask. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is that evidence for analog brains? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it is. It's the analog. It's sorry. It's evidence for the possibility of it being analog, but it's definitely evidence against it being like a digital computer. And so here's why. Um, in a digital computer, right? I said that usually we say, you know, it's zeros and ones. We all know that. How that's physically implemented is by zero volts and five volts, right? But if you actually look at what a computer is doing, it's actually a continuous voltage. So, you know, if we were to graph, like we're looking at a particular element of a computer and it's just, it's going say it's going from zero to one zero to one zero to one so what the voltage is actually doing hopefully you can see this is like it's kind of fluctuating around zero volts and then it jumps up here and it's kind of wiggling around five volts and then it's you know jumping down here right in a digital computer we've designed these things so we know that it's not really at zero volts it's like around zero volts right and up here, it's not exactly at five volts. It wiggles around five volts, right? But that little wiggle has no effect at all on further elements of the computer, right? It's actually continuous, you know, as continuous as something can be. But we've designed it so that that little wiggle just does not matter, right? And so that was one of the things that people thought was going on with neural spikes too. They thought, it looks like neural spikes. First of all, they thought, no, they just, you know, it's all or nothing. Then they thought, actually, it's kind of like this, you know, like there is a little bit of wiggle, but it looks like the system is designed. So that little bit of wiggle just does not matter. But now we know actually, you know, when, when it's neural spikes, if it's a little bit taller, that actually does have an effect on downstream neurons, right? So it's just, it's very clearly evidence against it being anything like a digital computer. Whether it really is analog or not, for me, is going to depend on are those neural spikes actually representing something? Because not everything that neurons do is about representation, right? But it's the possibility, at least, you know, the mechanism is there for it to be the kind of thing where, like, you know, a stronger stimulus, it's not just that it makes the neurons more frequent, but it makes the spikes a little bit bigger, right? And the little, we know the little bit bigger spike actually has an effect on the next neuron, right? So does that help? Yeah, that's Sorry, I mean, this all went so fast. So. No, that's, 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 yes. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully you can see my green wiggles. It's not a super dark marker. But. Okay, and then I think we, I had Melanson. Robert, were you in the queue or did you have someone from the audience? Uh, no, it was just, it's all me. Okay. I'm all about myself. So, <laughs> currently I have, do you want, so we want to go, so I think we have, yeah, uh, William, Robert, and Sir, and then Jake. Okay, so the following may just be really dumb. It's like, hey, you made me think of alligators, and alligators make me think of lunch, and it may have that. And if so, just shoot. Let's it let's go there. Let's okay. Go there. <laughs> so I'm wondering whether or not, if you're right, if the brain is analog in the ways you suggest it might be, whether or not you're you're trying to set us up for a solution for the nature of brute intentionality. Um, you know, how, how is anything, a, how, how are we about anything? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I'm thinking your little seven volt diagram, right? You're like, well, the seven volt just is, it's the thing, right? You're trying to get it over to the digital. Then we have to have this sort of, we have to say if this represents that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm taking that kind of idea mixing in a little bit of Dretzky, knowledge and flow of information, the frog and the BB and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And then throwing in a dash of the um, photograph versus painting kind of representation stuff that like, it doesn't matter if I dress up as, you know, Napoleon, it's a photograph of me, but if I dress up as Napoleon and you paint it, it's a painting of Napoleon. You, that, see how all that is poured into the big bucket and I'm trying to, you know, like the match and throw it on fire. Uh, and if you just want to roll, that's cool. <laughs> Do you see where I'm trying to put the, the pieces together to get some kind of brute intentionality? 
and, I, and get solve that solve that problem with this plus sort of Gretzky. You know, if what I'm doing can solve the problem of intentionality, I am all for it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I do see what you're getting at. Um, but honestly, I, I, I don't know what to say about that right now, other than I, I see what you're getting at. And I just have not thought about that. Okay, I didn't um, know if that was some, like, you had that. Oh, of course, like, this is how I got the solution. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, honestly, I, I'm, I'm as you can tell, I'm like dabbling in this pretty like low level neuroscience stuff just to get this account of computation kind of off the ground. Um, I mean, my hope is that, yeah, this will be useful, you know, as we step up to, you know, more traditional philosophical problems and whatnot. Um, that sounds really promising. So, you know, if I ever write that paper, I'll, I'll contact you and we can co-author it or you'll at least be in the acknowledgments or something. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything intelligent to say to add to that right now, other than that sounds interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll just put a quick finger and say that, I mean, it, it seems like your account of analog computation or what it is provides a kind of systematicity of environmental yeah. stimulus and yeah. what's going on in the inside, but it's not, but in, insofar as that's representational, it's not resemblance based, right? So it's not, you're not going to end up saying like this resembles this and that's why this only the represents really makes this, sense. right? Yeah. So yeah, you might have something that doesn't have that, like, because it's not arbitrary like words are supposed to be and it's not like resembling like pictures it provides like it were it affords like a different way of thinking about it so i mean but yeah, yeah. i've seen it uh yeah so i had um a question just about uh if the brain is an analog computer could it only be an analog computer i mean no. could it do both and how this the computations and representations at this level relate to like the thoughts uh, that we're capable of having at a person level, just insofar yeah. as it seems like we reason about things that are not represented in terms of magnitudes, at least at some level of abstraction. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, um, no, I, I'm absolutely not saying that this is the only way it could go. And I mean, you know, this is actually secretly a hybrid computer. Um, it's really pretty. Um, it's the uh, the Telefunken RA770, but it's an analog computer that also had um, a kind of analog to digital computer. So it could be hooked up to digital computers for some things too. Um, there's no way that our brains are actually digital computers, but they might be non-analog in some interesting way. Um, and what I mean by uh, non-analog is um, the computers that we all use, all of our laptops, to understand what they're doing at the kind of level of circuitry and the lowest level, it's all digital, right? But we know they implement a bunch of stuff that's not digital, right? Like word processors and you know Adobe Photoshop and all that kind of stuff. The representations at that level are not digital, right? They're arbitrary symbols, right? Like you go in Mathematica and you say, what's two, ply, two pi plus, you know, square root of four? And it just says, well, it's as good as it gets, two pi plus square root of four. Um, but that's not digital. It's just a pure, purely symbolic thing, right? Um, so it might be that, you know, at the level of the individual neurons and neural circuitry, it's all analog. I have no idea. The other thing that no one knows is if it is, how are the upper levels you know, implemented out of a fully analog based system. No one has ever done that, right? We know very well how to do from digital to, you know, non-digital. We have no idea how to do from analog to, you know, symbolic or non-analog. Um, not because we, it can't be done. It's just, you know, computer science never did that. That was not the, it's just a contingent fact about, you know, how digital computers evolved and, um, analog systems were forgotten about. Um, so I have no idea if it's, you know, maybe there's some reason it's theoretically not possible. Um, okay, so I guess I lose. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, certain sensory systems are analog and other systems, you know, just aren't. Um, 
or you know they're not actually computational in some principled way you know it could be that the whole idea that this is all computational is is mistaken right i mean like i said i think that's that's one benefit i think of being very clear about what it takes for something to be a computational system is then it can be kind of a hypothesis we can see you know yeah is this actually going to be a computational system or not there's some way to make it that it's that it's not but yeah i have i have no idea i mean because obviously yes when we're playing chess we're not using analog representations to play chess so clearly we don't always use analog representations or analog computations yeah yeah so this is more of a sort of philosophy line question than a sure. neuroscience body of science question i'm just curious I, I mean i like this idea that the analog representations sort of better respect the physicality mm -hmm. representation um, and I'm, I'm curious if you've thought about sort of beyond thinking about this at the level of neurons in the brain, sort of in activism or embodied ap approaches to the mind. I mean, does this lead us to a, a possible better account of embodied cognition, for example, if what we're representing is not just neurons, but broader? Yeah, so that I have thought about it a little bit. Um, I, I don't come from you know that kind of 4e cognition you know embodied extended i always forget the the, the other e's you know yeah <laughs> um and from my perspective sometimes it's a little hard to nail down you know they don't all have that much to do with each other um it's kind of a mistake to call those all the same family you know but there's there's family resemblance whatever um but in for particular um parts of you know people who are sympathetic with I mean, so it's not extended mind, um, but some of the people in in those traditions, they're kind of anti representation, right? But I think that they're cool. They would be cool with analog representation because it is so tied to the physicality, right? And so that's one of the things that I've been, you know, trying to kind of work on to make clear exactly how that works. Um, and so, just as one example, um, Tim Van Gelder had this piece in '95, I think. Um, that was the title was uh, well, what the what could the mind be if not computation was that it Joe Do you know oh representation yeah oh yeah no well, yeah the walk under one yeah yeah that'd be great where yeah Tim Van Gelder used this example of um, the Watt governor which was this mechanism that regulates um, the steam in a steam engine um, and the idea is. Uh, you know, you have, a, you have a boiler and it's producing steam, you can't just like add more heat to it and it'll, you know, instantly produce more steam or like take heat away. You know, it's, you can't control the steam very well, but you need a constant amount of steam in order to not break your machines that are steam powered. And so there's this kind of cool mechanism that basically um, it's kind of a spinner and has arms on the spinner. And it spins faster, the arms go out and, you know, like by centrifugal force, right? And as the arms go out, they're connected to a little mechanism that closes a valve. So, or like kind of partially closes a valve. So There's a really clever way of making it so that the seam is going to be constant um, after it goes out of this valve. And it's the kind of thing that you can analyze with some equations. And he said, this is a better model for how uh, we should think about the mind. Um, it's just some differential equations and it's a dynamical system, right? So it was one of the, the papers that introduced the idea of a dynamical system. And he said, you know, we don't need to talk about representations here. Uh, we can just talk about the, these equations. Um, on my view, the thing that he was talking about was a pretty simple analog computer, actually. Um, and it does have representations, but not the kind of representations that are like, you know, of a digital computer. Um, so, you know, I need to kind of make this point clearer, but yeah, I think that this, this does, this kind of computation does play better with the commitments of some of those 4 E folks, um, because I mean, they might say, yeah, this is kind of a thin notion of representation, um, but because it is more connected to the physical nature of the system, um, you know, I think that they, they, they might be cool with it. Yeah. But I don't have... I don't have this fully worked out yet, um, but you know, Van Gelder's paper. I mean, that 
like I said, that I would just say, yeah, that's an analog computer. That actually is a computational representational system. Uh, you know, I can tell you why. Um, so you don't have to be anti-representational. You can actually embrace some kinds of representation. They're just different than what you thought representations needed to be. Yeah. So a computer represents because we use the computer yeah. to represent, right? And the use of the computer to represent is, seems to be basic to its function for representing. So if the brain is a computer, analog or, digi or digital, um, who's using the brain to represent? There's a little man inside. <laughs> oh, that explains it. A little everything. person. Yeah. yeah. Right? Sure. And that's it's a homunculus. Yeah, yeah. Problem solved. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, this is a hard problem in cognitive science, right? Um, we need some kind of an account of representation, yeah, that doesn't require a kind of external user, right? Um, there's hope. I mean, for me, this is a bit of a weaselly answer, but I say look to the scientists. And when do they posit representations in some way that seems indispensable? Um, and so one of my favorite examples is the cicadas that came out, come up every you know prime number of years, like the 17 year cicadas and the 13 year cicadas or whatnot. Um, it seems like they have a, a counter. Um, and I mean, this is kind of incidental, but it seems like it's, it's a discrete analog counter where every year there's like this little structure and like another little bit gets added to the structure. And once the structure gets big enough, it like activates a thing. And then, you know, they know to like come out of the ground and fly around and, fly and find a mate or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, is that a representation? I mean, not for us. It seems like it's a representation for the cicada. And part of the reason is the cicada is responsive to that thing doing some representing, right? There's a mechanism that's like keeping track of in some rudimentary sense of what it's doing, right? Um, such that you can imagine if the cicada had a disease or something and that counter didn't work right, you'd say, well, you know, didn't count the years in the right way. Um, contrast that with like tree rings, right? Where we can say, um, you know, trees represent the number of years that have gone by. Is it a representation for the tree? It doesn't seem like it. You know, there's no mechanism, there's no part of the tree that like, oh, when it's reached a certain number of years, like do something. It's a representation for us. If we cut down the tree, we can, you know, date the tree by those rings, but it's not, you know, for the tree. And so that kind of pattern is something that seems to go on in a lot of sciences where we can say, you know, yeah, it is representing. And what makes it representing, you know, for that organism is that there is some mechanism that does something with the representation. Um, but I will say representation in general is a very hard problem. And uh, there's a theme here. Here's a, a weaselly, another weaselly thing I can say. And the weasel stuff is actually not weaselly. It's just, you know, there's division of labor and philosophy. Philosophy is hard enough. Um, I don't have a theory of representation at all. Um, what I do have is um, a set of things where if you say, hey, here's a representation, I can say, well, I have an account that will tell you whether it's an analog representation or a digital representation or something else entirely. But what I can't do is you give me something and say, I don't know if it's a representation or not. Tell me, like, I don't have a, a general theory of representation. I mean, luckily there are other people who are working on that. And, you know, hopefully we can all come together and <clears throat> solve everything. But yeah, that's just not, I'm kind of taking representations for granted. Sure. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to open the floor for maybe one, another qu last question. Sure. Does anyone have a wonderful last question message? Or not wonderful. Or not wonderful. <laughs> question. Either full of pep and zing or just full of confusion <laughs> or just anything. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess it's pretty kind of open and we've seen how potentially this, this can be really cool for 40 people for representation and intentionality, where I'm curious where you see this going. Oh, I have no idea. I mean, where I see this going, say, say more about what you mean. 
Uh, I guess it seems it seems uh, pretty important if if what the neuron is doing is really uh, like analog computation, what the brain is doing is analog computation, and so I wonder how how important you see this uh, being uh, and, and to whom. Um. It's a slightly difficult question because I don't know how to, I mean, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think it was somewhat important, right? We're just interesting. Um, but, you know, like I said at the very beginning, there are a lot of neuroscientists who say, you know, that the brain literally computes. Um, some neuroscientists are a little cagier about, you know, do they mean it in some like metaphorical or analogical sense? But some are really, um, clear that they mean, you know, it literally computes. And it's not a crazy idea because we know from, you know, forget everything I said about analog computation today, right? We already know from regular computational theory that um, what makes something a computer is just, it's like other things, it's functionally defined, right? We can make a, I mean, in theory, we can make a computer out of, you know, marshmallows and beer cans. Um, they're radically multiply realizable, right? So it's not crazy that brains could be computers. That's a that's a live option, right? If they do the right kind of thing. Um, but then it starts to look like it's a possibility, but it's also false if what you mean is a digital computer. They're just not, you know, they don't operate that way. And so the importance of this is to say, to kind of, you know, rehabilitate the notion that the brain, let's stick with the brain for now. The brain could be, literally computing, but in a way that we've forgotten about. Because now when we talk about computers, we almost always just mean digital computers, right? And it wasn't that long ago when that wasn't the case. I mean, in the 40s and 50s, digital computers were very rare and very expensive. And so usually what a computer would still be a person. And when someone said a computing machine, they meant an analog computing machine, right? Um, but then those, we just, Digital computers replaced those because they got way cheaper um, and then faster. And the people who were interested in in analog computation, you know, it's a kind of Coonian point. They just died, and so the analog computation just wasn't taught in universities anymore, right? But you know, it, it's not clear that analog computation is going to be the thing that's going to help us build better iPads, but it is a genuine, you know, legitimate form of computation. So, um, you know, in our kind of theoretical tool toolkit of kinds of things that might help us understand the mind and the brain, yeah, here's one that we've forgotten about, right? And like I said, in the, the little bit that we think we know about it, we've misrepresented it as like, oh, it's just about continuity, right? Um, so if you care about that kind of thing, you know, I think that's, that's helpful. Um, and then also, you know, the other thing is we, have tended to think of computation as this kind of, you know, abstract, divorced from any physical thing. It's, you know, abstract. Um, and this is a way that things can, can be computational in a principled way that it's much more in touch with like the physical nature of the stuff that implements it, you know? Um, so that just kind of changes our, our notion of what computation could be, um, you know, more generally that, like I said, you know, might be amenable to people who have different kind of commitments in cognitive science. So, um, yeah, does that sort of answer your question? Cool. Yeah, it was more about you, where you were thinking, where you were thinking things, but. I mean, it, yeah, that's, that's about as far as I've, I've gotten, I think. Yeah. Really cool, thanks. Yeah. All right, well, let's go ahead and thank our uh, speaker.